Welcome back to another series of mine about my experiences from a trip through another communist country. My visit to Cuba in late 2017 turned out to be full of interesting and unexpected encounters and the first two days we spent around Havana were just the beginning. The third day of our trip was dedicated to a guided whole day tour around the capital. Our guide was a local young man who was very knowledgeable and brought many interesting topics to our attention. He was a student and moved to Havana to work as a guide. He spoke great English and we soon saw that he loves Cuba very much. Still, he would like to travel abroad and visit other countries. Unfortunately, it wasn't possible as it would be too expensive for him and his family. As an alternative, he told us that we could send him some postcards from our travels, so he could, at least in that way, travel with us. We started the walk down the El Prado, as the people of Havana call the main old promenade leading through the city. It was built in the early 19th century and then redesigned in the 1920s. It is one of the symbols of the city together with the old fortress, El Capitolio and other landmarks. We walked past the school, which had some propaganda displayed in the entrance lobby. Castro, and I mean Fidel, was still present everywhere, even after passing away two years earlier. Our guide has explained to us that the children's education is mandatory and free. Everything is provided by the state except the uniforms, which children have to wear, but as he added, the cost was not high. When we saw some men sitting in the park, our guide told us that we were watching one of Cuba's problems. Socialist government provided, or at least at that time it still managed, enough free food and supplies to every citizen, young or old, more or less wealthy, to live on a day-to-day -day basis. It was insured through social programs and the network of social stores. We would see one of those later in the day. With many, mostly middle-aged and older people, that took away any initiative and will to work, as our young guide explained. Every day they would go to the social store for the ration they were entitled to and then spend the day relaxing with their friends with similar habits, playing dominoes or just chilling on the benches in the parks. There is nothing wrong with making a personal choice to spend your days like that, but too many people in working age living like that are holding the country back making any progress very difficult to attain. Many ideas and positive changes could not be achieved because of such a strain on the social system. Next, we passed by a local hospital. Cuba has an enviable health system, medical infrastructure and capabilities. Faced with the American embargo, they were forced to produce much of the medicine by themselves and became mostly self-sufficient in that area. Medicine is one of Cuban exports to their allies and they regularly send their doctors to areas around the world stricken with diseases and catastrophes. Walking around the old part of the city, we eventually got to Plaza Vieja, the most striking of Havana's city squares. It was built in the late 16th century and hosted executions, processions and also bullfights. 
In the 1930s it was demolished so an underground parking lot could be built. In the 1980s it was restored in the Cuban Baroque style. Here we had some free time and our guides suggested we try world famous coffee in one of the cafes located here. Matea and I ordered different coffees and she made the mistake of ordering one with milk. As we learned later, milk is quite scarce and very expensive to the local population. So in most of the government-owned restaurants or hotels, employees steal that milk. To cover it up, they add water into the supply of milk. That way, the milk in Cuba is very watery and tastes horrible. That also explained why the cereal I had for breakfast in the hotel tasted so bad. Watering down of the milk also had more serious and unpleasant side effects, which we would discover in a few days. After the break, our tour took us through the Plaza de San Francisco, one of the oldest city squares in Havana. We admired the old colonial construction style of the Church of St. Francis of Assisi and the buildings around the square. There were also a couple of modern statues scattered around the square and tourists were taking pictures with them. Nearby, in an enclosed courtyard, we saw a statue of Pope John Paul II. He visited the island in 1998 and also met with Fidel. It seemed unusual for a communist country, but I figured that Cuba is quite religious, as we kept noticing more and more churches while traveling around the island. Leading us down through one of the streets from the square, our guide showed us one of the social stores. Here, every Cuban can collect their allotted amount of food and other supplies the government provides for them. Each neighborhood in Cuba has one, and each Cuban has his or hers own little notebook for the store. In the notebook, it is written what amount of food or supplies a person could pick up every week, and what was already redeemed. Each person can use their notebook only in its own store in their neighborhood of residence. It is not possible to travel somewhere else in the country and get your share there. In a way, that makes traveling inside the country quite difficult for the poorest of the inhabitants. But I believe it was necessary for the already overstretched government apparatus. The amount which a person can receive varies and depends on the age and health requirements. Of course, there are no luxury goods, supply is limited to basic necessities. Meat is mostly limited to that skinny chicken we have seen for ourselves, as we mostly ate it on our organized trips. There was some bread, alcohol, rum, soap, cigarettes, but the store we saw was mostly empty. We also learned how valuable cows in Cuba actually were. As there was so little cattle on the island, all the cows were owned by the state and kept mostly for the production of milk and not for meat. The cows which we saw during our stay were very skinny. As a result of that scarcity, only people older than 70 years and pregnant or nursing women were entitled to one liter of milk a month. Our guide told us a joke that it is better to be caught walking around Havana with a kilogram of cocaine than with a kilogram of beef. That day, we had lunch in a privately owned restaurant. This experience was very different from the one in the government owned restaurant from the first day, or the one we found the day before. 
restaurant was much cleaner and more nicely furnished and also the staff was much more professional and actually happy to see us. The food was also much better and we also had live music during our meal. As they explained to us, this is the other side of the Cuban economy which became possible just a few years before our visit. Faced with more and more economic and social problems, the communist government started to ease the rules of the planned economy. They started to allow small private businesses and services like taxing, renting accommodation or restaurants. If they have a car, Cubans can provide taxi services, they can rent rooms or apartments. There are a lot of examples where family members migrate to the United States and send their salaries back to Cuba, where the rest of the family can use the money to start a bar, restaurant or a small hotel families running them are much more motivated to provide a better service than in those run by the government, and it shows. Our guide also explained to us that the private sector solution has already started to create new problems for the economy. For example, a hard-working taxi driver in Havana could, with a bit of luck, earn about 30 American dollars in one day. At the same time, that was the monthly salary of a doctor. It was a matter of time when everybody would rather be taxi drivers instead of some other important profession, because the state cannot afford to pay them enough. After lunch, we walked to the port of Havana. The city is situated around a large and deep bay, which makes a great protected harbor. The old part of Havana, which we have been exploring for the last couple of days, is located on the western part of the bay. On the opposite side, the old fortress is overlooking the entrance to the bay. Next to the fortress, there was a huge statue of Jesus watching Havana. The seawater in the bay was oily, probably from some leakage from one of the ships in the port or from the refinery in the end of the bay. On the opposite side, we could also see a naval base of the Cuban Navy and a few of their warships docked by the piers. Exactly in this bay, on February 15, 1898, American armored cruiser USS Maine exploded. At the time, Cuba was still a Spanish colony and the ship was sent here to protect American interests during tense times between two countries. In the explosion, around 260 Americans died and the damage was so severe that the ship could not be repaired. After conducting an investigation, the US Navy declared that an unspecified mine of unknown origin was responsible for the explosion. Later investigations indicated that there was an explosion in the forward ammunition magazines and that the sinking was an accident. The incident worsened already strained relations between the countries and the Spanish-American War started two months later. In the war, the US was victorious and took over most of the remaining Spanish colonies, including Cuba, which was from then under direct American influence until the victory of the guerrilleros led by Fidel Castro. Our side of the port was turned into the port for cruise ships visiting Havana. There were a lot of American tourists visiting the city this way, even if it was just for a couple of hours. The buildings in the port were mostly falling into disrepair and not many of them were actually used. I noticed a very strange visitor center which had a fake upper floor and it reminded me of the Potemkin's villages. 
Here is where we started the tour around the city in vintage cars. One of the trademarks of Cuba are American old timers. Before the revolution, the island was closely tied with the US economy and imported the majority of the cars from American manufacturers. After the embargo, import was stopped and people turned to the preservation of the cars they had. It's easy to see a lot of classic cars from the 40s and 50s driving around. Many owners of the rarer and more attractive models were renting them for private tours and sightseeing trips. After paying more attention, it seemed that people who owned a car spent most of their time cruising around in them. While sitting in some places, we constantly saw the same cars circling around and probably looking for tourists. I guess it made sense if the pay was so good compared to other professions, so they were driving around like the gas was free. Our group divided into a couple of cars and our drivers took us through the city streets. First stop was the Revolution Square, a large main city square typical for every communist capital. Similar ones can be found in the centers of Moscow, Beijing, Pyongyang, Hanoi and other similar cities. They are used for war parades, mass games and for creating awe at the visitors, domestic and foreign ones. At the center of the square stands a large memorial to Jose Marti, Cuban hero and one of the first revolutionaries who fought to free Cuba from colonial rule. During his time, that rule was Spanish. In the buildings around the square, the seats of the country's government and the Cuban Communist Party headquarters are located. Two of the buildings have silhouettes of two of the main revolutionaries, guerrilleros, on their facades. We saw Castro's top commanders, Ernesto Che Guevara and Camilo Cienfuegos. Both of them played huge parts in the Cuban Revolution from the start and Castro hailed them as indispensable. They were also very popular among the Cuban people. Unfortunately, after the guerrilleros and Castro came to power, both Che and Cienfuegos were removed from the picture sooner or later. Cienfuegos died in a plane crash under mysterious circumstances less than a year after the success of the revolution. Later, Castro sent Che Guevara without enough support to the jungles of South America where he was captured and executed. Castro stayed in power until his death in 2016. Next part of the trip through the streets of Havana took us by the Embassy of the United States of America. Like every American embassy abroad, it is a large building surrounded by high fences and surveillance cameras. It is located right on the square of anti-imperialism. I imagine that was Castro's sense of irony. We saw a large forest of flagpoles and the stage on which they hold various thematic programs, most likely having in mind those in the building behind it. The relations between the countries are slowly improving. The best indicator of that is the official visit of Barack Obama to Cuba in 2016. It was the first visit of the acting US president to the nation island since 1928. It was hailed as a start towards the normalization of the relations and possible lifting of the American embargo. Still, more than seven years later, no progress has been made in that field. Our old-timer tour ended in front of the Hotel Nacional. 
it is the most famous hotel in Cuba and one of the landmarks of the city and the country. Most people immediately associate it with the Godfather Part 2, which also takes place in Havana. Although the movie shows the Mafia choosing Cuba as their center of illegal activities in the Caribbean, none of the scenes were filmed here. Coppola was filming in the nearby Dominican Republic. Still, the outside and inside of the hotel look straight out of gangster movies. Old furniture and style complement the atmosphere. Walls are decorated with pictures of celebrities, actors and politicians who stayed in the hotel. We had a break and a few drinks in one of the salons. On the walls you can find people from all parts of the world, some of them famous and some of them infamous, depending who you ask. Matea and I started our free time for exploring with a visit to the gardens of the hotel. Surprisingly, a Cuban Missile Crisis Museum is located here. You can walk through the trenches and bunkers which were dug during the height of the crisis in 1962. Soon after cementing his power on the island, Castro turned to the Soviet Union for increased support, so he would stay in power. The Soviets welcomed the opportunity to have a communist ally on the doorstep of the United States and started supplying Cuba with weapons, food, oil and other materials. After the increased pressure of the US, Castro came to the conclusion that the security of his regime could only be guaranteed by hosting Soviet nuclear ICBMs. Americans led by the President John F. Kennedy would have none of it and set up a naval blockade around Cuba to stop further shipments of weapons. Chaos ensued as both sides refused to step down. Soviet and US fleets were on high alert in the Caribbean waters preparing for war and nuclear weapons were ready to go. An American U-2 spy plane was shot down over Cuba. Debris of the plane was proudly displayed in the Museum of the Revolution and we saw them the day before. They reminded me of the remains of another American stealth plane which were proudly displayed in a museum. A couple of years before, in Belgrade, I saw remains of the American F-117 Nighthawk, which was shot down over Serbia in 1999. But that is a story for another video. Local guide of the museum in the trenches showed us what it looked like on the shore which almost became a front line. On the opposite side of this sea is Florida only about 160 kilometers away. We were digging the defenses and were preparing for the attack. Most of the people were expecting the Americans to come at any moment. Very few Cubans thought that this could end as peacefully as it did. Luckily, after the talks between Kennedy and Khrushchev, the war, conventional and nuclear, was avoided and Cuba remained a beautiful tropical island. Our walk back to the hotel took us through the western parts of the city's center. First, we came across a souvenir market. All the sellers here mostly sold souvenirs and bargaining was recommended. This was known as the best place to buy souvenirs in Havana and we found all kinds of interesting stuff. Most common were various products made from wood. Old timers, trucks, decorations, then bracelets, hats, clothes and others. Most of it was handmade. There were also a lot of beautiful paintings with the motifs of Havana and its landmarks. 
My Matea found one of the most awesome souvenirs from our travels, a Cuban Revolution sticker album. Each sticker is a small cartoon aimed at children, I guess, and tells part of the story of the life under the dictator Batista and the heroic struggle of the guerrilleros. It reminded me of the album with the stickers of the Croatian army, which most of the Croatian children collected during the War of Independence. The Cuban one already came with the full collection of stickers and even had the special golden section with the heroes of the revolution. Our route continued through the large area of the University of Havana. It was founded in 1728 and is the oldest in Havana. There were not many people around, so we walked up the large staircase and passed into an inner courtyard. It was quite green and I imagine students resting here between classes. The most interesting detail I noticed was a metal statue of an owl holding a rifle. A symbol of wisdom was paired with a rifle, a symbol of the revolution. I guess that there is no escape from propaganda in a communist country. Next area on the map was marked as Chinatown. Despite walking straight through the area, we missed all the landmarks you would in fact expect from a Chinatown, which made us think that the name was just a symbolic nickname. However, it turns out that Havana indeed has the oldest and largest Chinatown in Latin America. There was a large number of Chinese people living in Cuba throughout its more modern history. All we managed to see were buildings typical for Latin America. Most of the entrance doors were opened and we could see inside the houses. In the rooms overlooking the streets, are living rooms in which people spend their days and probably host their guests. In some homes we saw televisions and all of them had a radio. In front of some houses people were playing dominoes and children were playing football in the streets. In general there was practically no traffic in the streets but we saw a lot of parked cars. Again, there were a lot of American old-timers, Russian Ladas, Volkswagen Beetles and after a long time I also saw the legendary Peglica, as Fiat 126 was known in Croatia. Many of those cars were rebuilt in various creative ways and sometimes a wholly new means of transportation were created. Unfortunately, the thing I remember the most about Havana is that it is so incredibly dirty and smelly. Most of the streets in the city are filled with trash. On every corner there are trash containers filled with garbage. Next to them there is enough trash to fill another container. By the sides of the streets there are ditches filled with dirty water which stinks. We saw all kinds of trash lying around on the streets, including a real severed pig's head. People usually don't notice it in promotional pictures, but after visiting Cuba you start paying more attention in photos and movies. Do not get me wrong, the city is beautiful. It is a shame it is in such a state. While walking down the Malecon back towards the hotel, we decided to sit at one of the many benches overlooking the sea. Despite the fact that it was New Year, it was a perfect promenade for a summertime walk. It wasn't long until we were joined by a local which spoke quite good English. I got the impression that everybody there speaks good English as they needed to communicate with tourists, similar as in Dubrovnik at home. 
he told me that he saw my wallet which was in my pocket and that I should take notice that he didn't take it. He asked where we were from. Do we love our country? He loves his country by the way, despite it having many problems. But he loves it and it is so beautiful. In general, he wanted to know if we could chip in a few dollars for him. Understanding his situation, we gave him about $10 and some chocolate he liked. In a way, hoping that he would move on to some other bench with some other couple. Unfortunately, that had a completely different effect. He started talking even more, especially about his troubles and issues. He also brought to our attention that I have a really nice shirt and that he cannot buy any such shirts in his neighborhood. Actually, he wanted to have it. I told him that I cannot give it to him as I am wearing it at the moment. He said, no problem, I go with you to the hotel and you can give me your shirts there. I replied that that was not an option. After that, he brought in a friend who was in even bigger trouble than he. It would be best if we could give his friend $20, or even better $30, or more. My impression was that no matter how much money we would give them, they wouldn't stop talking and bothering us, so we took off back to the peace and quiet of the hotel. Next day, we started leaving Havana and exploring other interesting parts of this incredible island. I hope you have enjoyed this part of my Cuban documentary, so please consider subscribing, liking and sharing the video so I have the incentive to make more of them. Thank you in advance.